Welcome to Press TV's book review show, Epilogue. Today we'll be looking at a book by Amna Dahoud Badram, um, Zionist Israel and Apartheid South Africa. But before that discussion, here's a short introduction to the topic at hand. Apartheid means separateness in the South African language. This segregation became a policy that was enforced by South Africa's National Party government between 1948 and early 1994. Under the apartheid, different races were kept apart in different schools, in different towns, in different jobs, with different doctors. In effect, there were two sets of laws, with one for each set of citizen. In 2002, the act of the apartheid became criminal under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Between World War I and 1994, the apartheid and Zionist leaders had a good relationship. Their relations blossomed in 1948, with South Africa being amongst the first governments to recognize the new state of Israel. In the 1960s, communication between the two countries' secret services became regular. This led to South Africa and Israel conducting joint military training and exchange programs. By the end of the 70s, the two countries had begun collaborating with nuclear technology. Some experts say Israel aided the development of South Africa's nuclear program by assisting them with building their first nuclear bomb. In 2004, the Zionist government built a separation wall that critics internationally have called an apartheid structure because it surrounds, isolates and economically strangles the Palestinian territories. Analysts say there are many similarities between the fallen apartheid regime in South Africa and Zionist Israel. Both states are the byproduct of outside implantation imposed on the indigenous population. But while South Africa's apartheid was explicitly based on the assumption of racial superiority, Israel is criticized for discriminating on religious grounds, although their government fully denies these allegations. Israel and the apartheid are comparable on many fronts, from the assault on the Palestinian and non-white South Africans' political rights to enforcing identification cards that have been arguably discriminatory, to inadequacies in their representations and so forth. In today's epilogue, we will further delve into the similarities of Zionist Israel and South Africa's apartheid state and discuss if Israel's policies are as unsustainable as South Africa's turned out to be. Today I'm joined by Victor Catan. Victor's a teaching fellow at the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy at the School of Oriental and African Studies. He's just published a book, From Coexistence to Conquest, which explores international law and the origins of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Also here today is Keith Razor. Keith is a spokesman for the Zionist Federation of Great Britain and Ireland. Um, nice to have you both with us. I think I should come straight to you, um, Keith, and say, do you feel that was a fair, um, balanced uh, introduction there in, in the video we just saw? It's utter propaganda. Hmm. To compare South Africa with Israel is utter, utter propaganda. Israel is a de democracy. In, when, in its uh, Declaration of Independence, it stated equality for social groups, religious groups. Hmm. It respects all religions, Christians, Muslims. They're all allowed to pray. The holy sites, holy sites are protected. It's just utter propaganda. We always looking at the, the Israel bashers, such as yourself, Ken, mm. who constantly like to bash Israel and look at Israel with a microscope. Why are we not looking at the countries with the true racist apartheid policies? Jordan, neighboring Jordan, in which the actual state law states no Jews are allowed. If that's not apartheid, if that's not racist, what is? Saudi Arabia, do they allow Christians to pray during the, during the first Gulf War when the American army was protecting Saudi Arabia from a potential Iraq invasion? The Christian soldiers were not allowed to conduct Christian services because it was disrespectful to Islam. And yet we always like, I don't, why do you? What is your agenda? You tell me your agenda and Press TV's agenda to constantly focus on Israel, Israel, Israel. Israel has democratic elections. 20% of the Knesset are Arabs. They have representatives in the High Court. There was an, an, a, a temporary Arab-Israeli president of Israel. You tell me, what country in the Middle East allows its minority groups, like gays, like Jews, the same type 
of equalities that Israel does to its minorities. It's a, it's a complete and utter propaganda uh, a mission by the book and by Israel bashers such as yourself who concentrate solely on Israel and not on the surrounding states who deserve a lot more criticism. Well, I'm particularly critical of all those medieval military dictatorships which largely tend to have been propped up by Western governments in order to defend Western oil interests in the area. But the reality is that it's Israel which is part of the Western economy, very tied in with the European Union, has all those preferential agreements, and therefore we actually expect part of our economic sphere, in a way that they, the Arab nations aren't, that will be more critical. And um, that's a simple reality. We can have more effect. I, I used to be intensely critical of the South African government, and when eventually the United States of America started imposing real um, sanctions, the apartheid system collapsed. I would love to in immediately invade Burma and overthrow that hideous junta. But it's a question of where the West can be effective. And as we've seen, all the vast power of the West hasn't been able to impose its will in Afghanistan <coughs> or Iraq. So the days when the West could organise the world as it wanted are gone. And you come down to these debates and intense debates that we have about these subjects. But why is Israel so sensitive? about the allegations that there are parallels here with South Africa. Because in reality, you do have a sort of the semi-theocratic state, and I'm opposed to all of them, I'm even opposed to the Church of England being the official religion here. Um, and you also have this sort of situation where, I mean, Israel after the war in 1967 could have had a choice of saying, we, well, we've now united the ancient land of Palestine, we will give everyone the vote, we will have a, a genuine um, two-state solution m amalgamated into one, let Arab and Jew live side by side with equal rights. But I mean, 40 years, over 40 years on, we've still got effectively I mean, Gaza as a prison. Um, and this wall that now is an economic block from, prevents the creation of a genuine... I'll, I'll answer that, yeah. First of all, the wall is not a separation wall, it's a security wall. Over a thousand people were killed by suicide bombs during the Second Intifada. The security wall, as you call it, only makes up 4% of the actual barrier. Most of it is actually uh, not a wall. It has reduced suicide bombings by 98%. So the actual reason that Israel put it up was to secure its citizens. And to call it an apartheid wall, a separation wall, is propaganda. It's propaganda. To say that Gaza is a prison, Let's, make, no, let, let, let's be honest about this. The only country on its border, remember there's two countries on Gaza's border, Israel and Egypt. Egypt, they're Av Arab brethren. Egypt is putting up a wall to divide itself between Gaza and itself. Egypt, in order to stop weapon smuggling. Israel, of the two countries, which is not even recognised by the controllers of, of Gaza, which is Hamas, who don't recognise, in fact they go further than not recognising, and they actually state in their mandate the destruction of Israel and the destruction of Jews worldwide. So let me ask you this question, why you call it a prison when Egypt on its border should be allowing supplies mm. and food to go through there? Why blame Israel? Mm. This is propaganda and that in itself is racist. Victor. I have a word. Um, well, the International Court of Justice, mm. which is a principal judicial organ of the United Nations, expressly rejected the view mm that the, the apartheid or the barrier, the fence, whatever you want to call it, was solely built for security mm. reasons. It annexes a large settlement bo blocks around Jerusalem into Israel. Um, and uh, it, it also takes over a lot of water resources. And it's not just the wall itself, it's the matrix of control, separate road system, permits placed on Palestinians mm. who can't move from one village to another or from Gaza to the West Bank or study in the West Bank and, and, and live in Gaza. Uh, they also have permit systems that affects them moving, living in, um, mo traveling to Israel, traveling outside of the occupied territories. There are also discrimi discriminatory legislation affecting marriage rights between Palestinian spouses in Israel and in the occupied territories. And then there's the, the, the special uh, legal regime for the settlements and the settlers. Mm. Israel uses military orders to channel Israeli legislation into the West Bank, which leads to two different regimes, legal regimes applying for Palestinian citizens and for, for Israeli citizens living in the occupied territories. So I think that there are parallels with apartheid South Africa, especially if you look at the occupied territories rather than Israel itself. If I may say, Victor,